What's up, Paradigm? If you have a copy of God's Word, grab it and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7 is where we're going to be at tonight. Uh, my name is Chad. If we're just now meeting, I am so glad that you made the decision on this beautiful fall evening to get here. And the Chiefs are on a winning streak. Thank you, Jesus. And I'm fired up. I don't know if that's why. Like, it didn't even look close last night. Anyway, so we, they, they looking good. Well, we are so glad you're here. And I don't know if you've come in here tonight, much like me, but this whole requirement for mask is just like getting old, y'all. And I don't know if you've had some, some unique issues with your own body in your mask. Like, first of all, I don't know if you've worn a mask and you're like, did I really, have I brushed my teeth at all this year, you know? Um, or uh, how many of y'all have sneezed inside your mask and you're like, it's like a wet diaper that I'm wearing now, you know? And I was at a store earlier wearing my mask, of course, and, um, and, I, and I felt like I had something in my mouth, like a piece of fuzz or something. And so, you know, y'all probably had this happen before. And so I... You know, I pulled my mask off and I figure out what was in my mouth. It, it turns out it was one of my nose hairs that had gotten in my mouth. And I was like, oh, that's gross. And so I just put it back in there. Um, and then um, I don't know if you've had this, um, this happen yet, but this is probably the most frustrating thing when it comes to the whole mask issue. Um, I was at the store um, earlier today, just had some time to go shop for a minute. And um, so I, I get out to Leewood, Kansas, and I'm shopping and I, you know, I figure out the store where it's at. I park my truck and... And I, and I start walking, the door's wide open because it's a beautiful day today, and, and so it's very inviting. On the other side of the door is like the adventure awaits. I was going to L.L. Bean to look at some outdoor gear, and, and so I, I walk up, and I, sure enough, I see the sign. You're like, mass required. Y'all see this sign before? And, and I get about 10 feet to the building, and I start doing this number, you know, like I got my... See the truck! Oh my gosh! You know, and you just stop over there, you know. <laughs> Let that happen, and maybe you've responded that way. But anyway, uh, <laughs> it's so irritated that I have to put on a mask in order to freely enter in the store, that it's a requirement for me to put this thing on so that I can go do the thing that I was hoping to do. And I share that story with you tonight because just like a mask is needed to go in just about any place right now, you and I need something very specific in order to follow Jesus. And the thing that I'm talking about that you and I need is this thing that the Bible calls repentance. Now, um, that's not a word we use a lot in our culture, so we're going to break that down here in a little bit, because if repentance is the requirement in order for you to enter in a right relationship with Jesus, that's kind of a big deal, right? And so think about the store earlier. Like, I had to put on a mask to even be able to walk freely through the door that was open. And so Jesus tells us that he is the door and he is open to all. So if you come in here tonight and you're wondering if, if God wants a relationship with you, the answer is a resounding yes. You don't, have to, you don't have to pick the lock to get to heaven. Jesus already did. He is the door. You have to pass through a relationship with him. And on the other side of Jesus awaits this grand adventure called following him and life in God. But there is a requirement in order for you to be able to approach Jesus properly, and the requirement is repentance. In fact, Jesus' first sermon that he ever preached, the first words that are recorded from Jesus in the Bible, he says this, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Th that he's saying that you've got to put on this thing called repentance before you can rightfully follow me. Now again, not a common word in our culture, right? We don't, we don't use this a whole lot in the, in the English vernacular. Uh, but in the Bible, this is perhaps one of the most common messages all throughout the scripture. And if you've come in here tonight and you've, you've had this desire to, to arrive to who God has created you to be, you're going to need repentance. If you've come in here tonight and, and you have this, this desire to like, I, I want to uh, discover my purpose in life, and then I want to accomplish my purpose with passion, you're going to need repentance. If you've come in here tonight and there are some things in your life that you're like, man, I wish I could just get over these things. That When I started them when I was in middle school or high school, it seemed like no big deal, but now they've kind of got hooks in my life, and I'm trying to get free from some of these things. And if you're going to walk in freedom, the freedom that Christ wants you to walk in, you're going to need repentance. So we're continuing this series called Paradigm. And you've come in here to a place called Paradigm, but we're in a series called Paradigm, and, and a paradigm is basically a way of doing life. And so here's what we've said along the way, that you've come in here tonight and, and every one of you has come to paradigm with your own personal paradigm. And what we mean by that is that you have an approach 
or a way to do life. And so in this series, what we've been doing is that we've been challenging your thinking in the hopes that Jesus will begin to change your heart and your living. And so we, we've been looking at Paul, this guy that wrote over three quarters of the New Testament, and Paul's been putting on like this master class on how to change and how to have sustainable, deep-seated, life-transforming change. And what Paul has said is that if you're going to have change, you're going to need to know the author of your heart, the one that knit you together in your mama's womb. You're going to need to know God, and you're going to need to have a right relationship with God through Jesus And then you're going to need to identify the self-centered ways of change that you've approached life with. Because if you try to begin to change on your own with you as the hero, it's not going to work out for you. And so we deconstructed those things. And then last week, if you were here, it got a little bit tense in the room because we was talking to you. And we got specific about some things because we said that nothing, your life will never be dynamic if you just kind of stay in the comfort hot tub of generalities. I'm just trying to get better at love. No, Jesus wants to get in your kitchen. He wants to get specific in your life. And so hopefully last week you identified one to two things that you're like, man, I really need to surrender this thing over to Jesus. And so we've been in the preparation phase, but tonight we start the process. And we're going to take the first step that you and I must address in order to be able to enter in life in Christ. If you're taking notes tonight, I've titled this, mes- this message, excuse me, step one. Step one, repentance. That repentance is the beginning of you seeing true, transforming, sustainable change in your life, that you've come in here with a way of life or a paradigm, and we want to challenge that, and we want to propose to you from God's word a new paradigm. And so we're going to look at repentance tonight. We're going to answer these three questions. Uh, What is it? Why is it so hard? And then how do you do it? So Paul, he's writing to this church in Corinth. And, and when you study about the, the people in Corinth, like you, you gotta understand, like, well, they were, the odds were stacked against them when it comes to like following Jesus, all right? Like they didn't have like a granddaddy and a praying Medea, and they didn't have all that stuff that was just working together to help them out, all right? They didn't grow up in church, they didn't grow up singing church songs. Ain't nobody in Corinth ever followed Jesus before. These were first generation followers of Jesus, and they were in a culture that makes Vegas look look like, um, you know, Smallville or something like that. I don't even know if Smallville's a nice place. Anyway, it makes Vegas look like a nice, like Greenwood, all right, if you know this area. And so this place in Corinth, like they used to get buck wild up in Corinth, all right? And so you have all of these people that are saying, you know what, I want to surrender my life to Jesus. I know that he died for my sins, rose from the grave. He has power to help me be who I've been created to be. But I kind of like doing these other things too. Like you mean that I got to, like I, I want forgiveness, but I kind of want to do my own thing when it comes to my sex life or when it comes to my money. Like they, they were affluent in Corinth. They had some bank. And so they're like, you know what? I don't know if I want to be generous. I don't know if I want to treat people that ain't like me like God treats them. I'd rather just be prejudiced or I'd rather just whatever it is. And so they were trying to overcome some serious issues that were embedded in their life. And they had, this is what they had done, they had trusted Jesus with their forever, but they were having a hard time surrendering to Jesus there today. Hello, somebody, is that somebody here tonight? You trusted Jesus with your, God, I give you my heart, my soul, you, I, I, I trust you for heaven, but I kind of want to get high today. I kind of want to just go over there today. I kind of just want to be lazy today. I kind of just want to do i like, I, you got me forever, but I don't know if I can surrender to you today. And I think that this is not just a problem in Corinth. That somehow this problem that existed thousands of years ago has transferred throughout the eons of history in my life and in your life today. And so Paul, he, he writes a letter. You know, sometimes when, when you're trying to represent God and tell people what God's word says, sometimes you're going you're gonna to stir the pot a little bit. Like I, I was in a conversation just yesterday and I was like, hey, hey, you know, I was calm. I was cool on the outside. But I said this, hey, you're not going to like this that I'm about to share with you. That sometimes you just got to speak the truth and let the truth do its work. And sometimes it's going to be a little bit offensive. But Paul, he was a faithful man of God, and so he preached and he taught the word unapologetically, and he let it do its work. But in this particular occasion, he had offended some people. 
And Paul's writing to them, and we pick up in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, starting in verse 9. Paul says this, now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry. I get it, Paul's like, man, I, I'm so fired up, like not because y'all are upset, all right? Paul wasn't just like trying to drop truth grenades and be like, yeah, that's right, you need to get right. He wasn't bullhorn and, and poster board down at the plaza, hey, you need to turn or burn, yeah. Think about, you know, no, that's not Paul. He says, now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but here it is, but that your sorrow led, here's the word, re, to repentance, to repentance. Again, Paul, he's saying, I'm not happy that I made you upset. Like if you come in here tonight and I say something that kind of gets up in your grill, I'm not trying to get up in your grill just to be, you know, just to be bossy or a bully or something like that. But sometimes the truth hurts, but, the, but true love always speaks the truth in love. And that was Paul's commitment. And he's saying, I'm not happy that I made you upset, but Paul, like a skillful surgeon, knows that sometimes you have to inflict pain in order for there to be progress. Point number one, if you're taking notes, you could write this question down. What is repentance? What is repentance? If the product of the pain that Paul had inflicted upon them was repentance, and this was a good thing, and that Paul was rejoicing, not because of their sorrow, but because of what was on the other side of their sorrow, he was rejoicing because of repentance. What is it? Repentance, if you're taking notes, it's the Greek word metanoia, and it literally means a change of mind. It literally means to change your thinking. It's like, you know, I thought about this a certain way, but then I understood what was on the other side of that, and that was not going to help me get ahead in life, and so I had to rethink and change the way I approached this thing. Repentance, it's the main message of the Bible, y'all. When you study the word of God, you'll find that there were men and women of God that spoke as if God was speaking through them, and their message was one that was just on repeat, and the message that was on repeat was repent. So you read all throughout the Old Testament, guys will show up, and they're like, hey, y'all need to change your mind in the way that you view God and the way that you view your life. And then you, you turn a few pages over, Jeremiah, he's saying, he's crying a little bit, but he's like, hey, y'all need to change your mind. You need to repent. You need to change your mind in the way you view God and the way you view life. And some of y'all come in here, you know a little bit about the Bible, and it's, it's divided into two sections, Old and New Testament. You're like, well, the New Testament, that's all about love. And so obviously there's going to be a different sermon in the New Testament. Nope. John the Baptist steps onto the scene, J to the B is what I like to call him. He steps onto the scene, breaks the silence, and he breaks the silence with an all too familiar message. Repent. Oh, but Jesus is different. Jesus steps onto the scene, his first sermon, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Peter, the apostle, he preaches in the day of Pentecost and he says this, repent so that times of refreshing may come. Well, maybe by the end it will change, but when you go to the end, the last book is Revelation, just before you get to maps, you look at the words of Jesus and Jesus says to the churches, you done this, you done that, but here's what you need to do. You need to be zealous and repent. That repentance is the main message of the Bible. That the way out of every ditch that you and I have fallen into is repentance. That if you want to journey with God greatly, you and I, we need to get a PhD in repentance. And repentance is less about what you fell into but more about how you getting up and how you journeying on the journey with God. And so Paul, he's saying, you've got to understand that I'm rejoicing because of the outcome of this sorrow and some of this conflict that we had. Repentance, when we look at the scripture, we find out that repentance is a command by God. In Acts 17, verse 30, it says this, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. It not only is it a command, it's just, this is God's heart for everybody. He says in 2 Peter 3, 9, that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but he's long surf, suffering, he, he's patient towards us. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It, it's a command, it's God's heart, but also you gotta understand that repentance is a gift. I, I think sometimes when you grew up in church and maybe you heard messages like this, you're like, well, I'll repent when I'm good and ready. You know, I'm gonna do what I wanna do in my 20s, and then when I get in my 30s, I'm gonna clean it up. You know, once I meet Mr. Right, once I meet Mrs. Right, we're gonna get it all right. 
and I'm going to clean it up, and then that's when I'm going to get right with God, too. I'm have, maybe we, we're going to be crazy a little bit in our early years of marriage, but then when we have kids, we're coming back because Lord knows we're going to need some help with my kids, you know. And so you start thinking, I'm going to repent when I'm good and ready to repent. Well, you're wrong because you think that you're in the driver's seat of repentance, and you need to read your Bible. Because here's what it says in my Bible, and probably true of your Bible, 2 Timothy 2.24 uh, 2, 24 through 26, Paul, he's given some instructions to the servant of the Lord, and here's what he says. He says, the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but he must be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, and here it is, if God perhaps will grant them repentance, that repentance is a gift, and that when we hear the word of God stirring in our hearts and we stiff arm him, we're rejecting the gift, and the gift may not always be available. That's why the scripture says over and over, when you hear the word of God, do not harden your heart. This was the fall of Pharaoh that led to the liberty of God's people in the book of Exodus, if you care to go back and read that story. God came to him moment after moment, and each time Pharaoh hardened his heart to the voice of God. In verse 26, Paul tells Timothy, he says, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. That repentance, it, it's a command, it's God's heart, it, it's a gift. And finally, repentance is grief over your sin. It's grief over your sin. That's why Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 7, 9, says, now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow, that you had sorrow, and it led to Repentance. Uh, this word sorrow is the re Greek word lupeo. And when you do a word study on the, the usage of this word, you find that 25% of the usage of lupeo is right here in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. That, that one of the greatest teachings on repentance draws a direct correlation to the emotional expression of grief. And so have you grieved over your sin? And if you have not grieved over your sin, I don't know that you've truly repented. And it sounds weird that God would kind of advocate and that he would be almost excited, that, that Paul would say, I rejoice, that there would be grief. It, it doesn't make sense. But, but here's what we find in one of the greatest chapters of repentance, Psalm 51. It says this in Psalm 51, verse 17. It says, these sacrifices of God, here it is, are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, these, O oh God, you will not despise. A famous theologian in the 20th century, he was talking about repentance. And here's what he said. He said that we need to beware of vain or overhasty repentance. And what that means is that you've got to be cautious of you hearing some things like this and then just kind of haphazardly making some hollow promises and saying, okay, God, you see me promising, you see me maybe shed a tear, and then nothing really ever changes. You've got to be careful of vain or over-hasty repentance, he says, and particularly, let us beware of no repentance at all. When was the last time you repented? Think about that. And he goes on. He says, we are a sinful race, ladies and gentlemen, a sinful people. And until the knowledge has hit hard, until it has wounded us, until it has got through and passed the little department of our theology, it has done no good. And if you take a note, you could write this part of the quote down. Repentance is a wound I pray we may all feel. That repentance is a wound. And so, you know, part of my job is that I'll, I'll share things like this, and then uh, here in a minute we'll dismiss. You guys get to kind of do, do what you want to do, and, and I always invite people, hey, we're going to be up here. If you want to come up here, let's have a conversation. Let's talk life. And so oftentimes it's kind of like a spiritual ER. You know, people come in, and, and their spirit is bleeding, and I'm like, you know, let's, you know, I'm trying to assess the injury, and, and I'm trying to ask questions, and, and, and then a lot of times it's like people know why they're bleeding. They're like, I made a decision to start looking at pornography when I was 15, and now I'm addicted, and I can't because I'm 28, and there hasn't been a week that has gone by where I have not looked at pornography and touched myself. 
or I made a decision, or I was in a place when I was 12, and they were passing, the, they were pup, pup, passing, and I was like, yeah, you know, it is no big deal, but I liked it a little bit. Then I started buying it. Then I started dealing it for a little bit, but I thought, you know, I can't get ahead in life, so I quit dealing it because that's too bad, but I kept my dealer's number, and so now I'm 25 years old, and I can't imagine getting through a week without getting high once or twice. And they'll come down and they'll begin to tell me and they're like, man, but I, but I recognize this is not what God wants for my life and I need to change. We've all been there. And I hope that maybe if you, if you haven't gotten there, you'll get there. And they're like, they're like you know, pastor, they don't, maybe they don't even know my name, pastor, Chad, whatever. Um, what do you think I should do? And here's what I say. You need to go home and you need to pray for brokenness. Because I, uh, you know, just even uh, sometimes I'm like, man, just even hearing you talk, you know, you're just kind of like, yeah, you know, I just kind of struggle with this. It's no big deal. And I'm like, I don't, I just don't know. I, I don't have the confidence that you and God are on the same page about your sin. And so maybe you need to go think about having a son. Think about having a son. And then think about killing him. Because of someone else's sin. Get that in your mind and go home and think about what you are doing. And be broken over your sin. And I shared that because that's my story. Nothing really ever changed in my life until I, I had a new understanding of the holiness of God. And I was like, oh man, we are way different than I thought. <laughs> and I keep running back to this. And you gave your son for me. God, I don't deserve anything you've given me. I'm broken. Pray for brokenness. Because when you are broken, you are on the verge of putting on repentance. Now, Paul, he goes on in 2 Corinthians 7, 9, he says, For you were made sorrow, sorry in a godly manner. He says that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. Verse 10, he says this. This is a key verse. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. So Paul, what he's doing right now is that he is juxtaposing two types of sorrow. And I think that we've come in here tonight and most of us know the difference between uh, these two types of sorrow when I explain them. So let me try to explain them as simply as I can. There's the sorrow that is called worldly sorrow. And, and that sorrow is like, man, I'm sorry that I got caught. All right. Y'all all been there before. You know, you, you, you were doing something that you knew you weren't supposed to be doing and then you finally got caught. And, and, and the, what's marked by worldly sorrow is it, a lot of times it's grief. I'm like, man, I shouldn't have done that. I'm so sorry. I let everyone down. But typically what's marked by worldly sorrow is discovery. I'm sorry I got caught, it was discovered, I'll try to do better next time. Paul's juxtaposing or comparing side by side worldly sorrow to godly sorrow. And godly sorrow is, God, I'm sorry that I sinned against you. And typically, godly sorrow is marked by disclosure. What I mean by that is, is before anyone else finds out, I want you to know I am broken over this and I am freely offering this information. And what, 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 what's at, at stake here is that a lifetime of worldly sorrow will lead to death spiritually forever. Right. And you can, you can go to the end of your life and you can be sorry that you didn't do, you could have tears on judgment day before Jesus. And him look at you, tears and all, and say, you chose this place forever. And Paul is saying that there's another sorrow, a godly sorrow, and it leads to repentance. But why is it so hard? Like if, if this is at, if, if heaven and hell is at stake, why is this so hard? Point number two, if you're taking notes, why don't you just write that down. Why is, why is it so hard? The it there is repentance. Why is repentance so hard? There's several reasons why repentance is hard, but let me just talk through a few of them with you guys real quick. And, and maybe your life is kind of like my life, and this has been true in my life, so maybe it's been true in your life. That the reason why, the reason why we sin, and the reason why sin has power in our life, is because we love it. 
But the reason why repentance is so hard is because we like, and I would even say we love to sin. The, the sin, I mean, it, you know, a lot of times we'll talk about it in the church like, sin, that's gross. Who would want to do that? You're like, well, you ain't hung out with me because if that's sin, then that's kind of nice and, you know, that sort of thing, right? Let's just get real. That temptation is tempting. And we love to sin. I mean, I could be like, show of hands, who loves to overeat? Everybody, yeah. Who loves to overdrink? Yeah. Who loves to have sex? Yeah. You know, I mean, we, we would kind of collectively agree that when it comes to indulgences, we're Americans. We love to sin. And that's what makes repentance and following Jesus oftentimes so difficult. And so we'll look at those things, and then we also, like, you know, we like to, you know, have recreational things. So uh, we'll, we'll play in softball leagues, or we'll just kind of do what young adults do, and, and oftentimes we'll never really come to grips with the fact that we have wasted about five years of our life on chasing hollow accomplishments, you know? that aren't making a difference in the world, but we've just been spending our time the way we, we want to spend our time, or we have this thought, you know, like, I'm going to grind right now in corporate America or in my entrepreneurship or whatever, and once I get it off the ground, then I'm, about, I'm going to be generous, y'all. I'm about to give so much money to so many different places, but we are not giving any money to any places right now. And we think we're just going to turn that on, but we're just basically doing life the way that we want to do life. And repentance is hard because temptation is tempting. And oftentimes we don't believe about sin what the Bible says is true about sin. I heard one theologian who recently passed away, Ravi Zacharias, say it this way, that sin will take you farther than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay, and it will cost you more than you want to pay. And if you don't think that that's true, you ain't lived life long enough, right? And you think, why do I keep going back to this? It doesn't ever end well for me, but oftentimes we think, you know what, this time's going to be different. Like, I know I kind of like crazy guys, but, you know, like this guy, he's crazy, but he's like a, he's like a tame crazy. And so, like, this time it's going to be different. And we oftentimes think that we're going to be the exception to the rule when the rule has proven true all throughout our life. And I don't know if you've opened up your eyes, but sin is a real enemy that is seeking to steal, kill, and destroy you and I. You know that Satan doesn't send anybody to hell? Sin does. He just tempts us to take the bait. Genesis 4, 7, early on in the story, sin is pictured as a tiger that is crouching at your door, seeking to pounce on you, rip out your jugular spiritually, and then eat you up. Like, but it's so cute, Tony the tiger, right? Like we just kind of entertain it that way because we, oftentimes, we don't believe what Jesus believed. That every one of you has a personal struggle that's like a tiger sitting outside of your heart's door seeking to devour and dominate your life. And oftentimes it comes in the package that is like, oh, it's no big deal. But every sin comes prepackaged with consequences. So um, I wonder like, like, how, how do you reflect on your past, right? So when, when you talk about, like, you know, the things that you've done, you know, um, when we talk about your past sin, if you will, like, how, how do you talk about it? Like, I was with some guys the other day, and they were talking about how many women they've been with. Not that guys would ever, you know, talk about that kind of stuff, right, guys? Um, and so, but they were, they were bragging. I felt kind of awkward that these guys, you know, I don't, I know them well, and so I was kind of surprised by this. They're, they're not really, one of them's not following Jesus. It'll make sense in a second. These weren't like our team leaders or our ministers here, okay? Like, Chad was in the office and the pastors? That's weird. Um, no, it wasn't that. These are, these are guys outside the church. And so one guy was like, uh, hey, 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 bro, how many women you been with? And, and the other guy was like, um, I, I, he, he didn't really answer. And then the other guy was like, 14, 14. And so he was reflecting back upon it. He's married now. He's reflecting back upon his past. He's bragging. And the other guy, when asked again, so how many, how many girls have you been with? He looks up and says, man, it doesn't matter. And I wish I'd never been with any of them. And he's a married man too. So what about you? When you talk about your, your past, do you brag about it, or are you broken over it? 
that sin is hard because we love it so much. And you may say, I've left that love of sin, but when you get with your old buddies and you start talking about what y'all did in high school, what y'all did in college, or what y'all did when y'all was first in the company, how do you talk? Do you brag or are you broken? Uh, repentance is also hard because like you and I, there's something that we've all come in here and we're good at this. Like every one of us can do this thing that we're about to talk about that makes repentance incredibly difficult. We could all do it like blindfolded with one hand tied behind our back. That's how good we are at this. And the thing I'm talking about, what makes repentance difficult is that we can justify just about anything. That we can rationalize why it's okay for us to do what we know we shouldn't do. And repentance is when you recognize the rationalizations that you have in your life and you tear them down. Y'all know the rationalizations like, uh, you know, just, just one time. It's just one time. You, know, you only turn 21 once. It's, man, it's just one snort. It's just one hit. It's just one joint. It's just one night. We begin to justify it. Or, or we say things like this, no one will ever know. It's just me and my phone, me and my secret account, and no one will ever know. Like we, like we think if it gets cloudy outside, Jesus can't see. It's like, where'd they go? Like where, I don't, Holy Spirit, we're, I guess they get a pass on this day. You know, I don't, I don't, like I don't, that's not how God works if you think that's how it is. Like God knows everything. Every thought, everything. And the scripture is clear it says this, that be sure your sins will find you out in the book of Numbers. That you may be getting away with it right now and no one knows right now, but it's going to come out. That I don't know if y'all seen the corn stalks lately, but you know how they got there? Because when nobody was watching, some little farmer put a seed and he covered it up. Nobody will ever know. And now we got corn mazes going on right now, all right? And that is a picture of every decision that you and I make. But we think, well, that, you know, not me. I'm getting away with this. No one ever, or, or maybe this one. Everyone's doing it. Everyone's doing it. And so, like, it's, I mean, this is new. These are new times. Everyone's doing it. But listen, the majority response does not validate the reason why you should do something. That the majority response is not a test for validity. I don't know if you know this, but, but popular does not equal biblical. And so when you look at what's going on, and I mean, we're a Christian nation, are we really? Like when you look at what's popular in our society, sometimes we think, okay, well, that's, then that's what God wants. But I don't think that's what God wants. Slavery was popular in our society at one point. And popular doesn't always mean Biblical. And just because everyone is doing it doesn't mean that you and I should do this. Because everything that God forbids, he is right about. But we want to we be like, you know, maybe God got it wrong and these are new times. I mean, we justify these things, right? And sin is, it's fun for a season, but it does come with consequences. We play with sin when it's like a little lion cub, and we think, oh, I can feed it, and it's going to be good, but then it gets bigger, and then it gets dominant, and what you chase today, it will capture you later. And you may be in control right now, but you're going to get out of control soon. Or, or maybe one of these things that we, we say, one of the justifications we have is, this cannot possibly be wrong. Like, I cannot feel this good, feel about this person like this, or, I mean, God created all this, and so he, surely he meant for me to use this to do this. In this pot, this, you know, I, God would want me to be happy, right? And so if I'm in a bad relationship, I mean, we're married and everything, but, you know, there's forgiveness for divorce, and so, yeah, I just get out of it because I'm unhappy. Or, or how about this one? God will forgive me. And I don't know if you've ever done this before where you planned your weekend and it was like Friday and Saturday, I'm about to get crazy, but then Sunday I'm going to go to church, I'm going to get it all right. And, and you plan like your sin and your forgiveness plan all in the same thing. And you thought, you know what, it's okay because God, you know, God's good at forgiveness. I'm going to get real good at sin just for 48 hours, but I'm going to get all, I'm going to get right. 
And then so we'll just, you know, like, God, I'll help you help me, you know, make you look good, you know, because I'll be like really low and then you help me, help me, you know what I'm saying, God, right? And what Jude says is that there is a, there is a, a curse upon, Jude 1.4, there's a curse upon those who turn the grace of God into a license to sin. It's what Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a famous theologian in the 20th century, said, it's called making the grace of God cheap. It's like, yeah, I know you gave your life for, you know, my, my forgiveness and, and my sin, but I'm just going to keep doing it because, you know, that wasn't that big of a deal. And these are the rationalizations that we have. This is why repentance is so hard because we can justify things. Or maybe the, the, the reason why repentance is so hard that, that gets us the most is because repentance requires, we don't like this one, repentance requires, this may be the reason why it's so hard in your life, and I know maybe in my life, repentance requires, and this is the thing, like when we think about this thing, this is oftentimes like the deal breaker, all right? And so oftentimes this is the one reason where we get stuck. You know, like I know, like, yeah, sin, I love it, like I, I can figure that out, or, you know, yeah, I've been rationalizing, but oh wait, you want me to do what? And here's the thing, the reason why repentance is so hard, thirdly, is because you have to sacrifice. You're going to have to stop some things. And we don't like to sacrifice. And repentance is so difficult because you're going to have to sacrifice some things. That sometimes we get so trapped up in something. Like I was talking to a guy and he bought a bunch of steroids. God started convicting him. He's like, man, I don't need to be doing these drugs. What do you think, Chad? I'm like, yeah, that's not a good idea, right? And so, but he had bought all these drugs. He's like, man, but I committed to all these steroids. And, and so, uh, but, but I'm good. Like I just, I, I'm not taking them, but I'm keeping them. Not a good plan, all right? And the reason why he was keeping them because he's like, man, I'm gonna spend a lot of money on them drugs. So I'm just gonna keep them and then maybe like Facebook market, I don't know where you sell steroids. I don't know where you sell them anyway. I'm gonna try to figure out how to, how to fix this thing. And I'm like, you need to throw them away. You're gonna have to make a sacrifice. I don't know, like, I think that we can make this work. I don't know that, that we got to break up. Like, like, I just, I mean, I love her and she loves me. And I'm like, I, I don't doubt that, bro. But I think the problem is, is that you love her more than you love God. And you can't love somebody more than you love God. And so you're saying, I want to be God's man. I want to be God's man. I want to be a leader. But you're not loving God in order to get there. And you're not willing to make the sacrifice to have the hard conversation and be the man. And you're going to have to sacrifice. And I don't want to sell you something like this is going to be easy. This is hard. Wasting money, wasting time, having hard conversations. Like sacrifice, it can be devastating. But the sorrow of sin, it can be damning. And so the sorrow of sacrifice, yes, it can, be, it can be devastating, but the sorrow of sin is far worse. And here's what I know to be true. You will never regret a sacrifice that you make for your relationship with God. But you'll always regret sacrificing your relationship with God. I'm calling you to repentance. This is the first step in you becoming the man or the woman that God's created you to be. And again, you will never regret a sacrifice that you make for your relationship with God, but you'll always regret sacrificing your relationship with God. So what do you need to sacrifice? What's the thing the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now? You got specific last week. And what's the decision that you need to make? M maybe it's you delaying something like, like maybe it's your sex life and you need to make a decision that I'm going to sacrifice pleasing that aspect of my life until I get in a God-honoring marriage where I can game on. That a, that a pleasure delayed is a sacrifice made. That, that, that you can delay certain pleasures so that you can experience them in a greater way and God wants to give you, at the right hand of God is pleasures forevermore. And so maybe sometimes God says, not now, and we hear not ever, but God is trying to lead us to life and life abundantly. You got to sacrifice. You got to grieve. You got to be honest with what you have done. Sometimes I think that we block out of our minds some of the things that we've done. You've got to be honest. You've got to dig up some of those things, and you got to take them to God and say, God, I had the abortion. God, I pressured her to have the abortion. I sinned. 
I squandered it. I squandered my 20s. I, I've wasted my platform. I'm on social media thinking I'm, I'm converting people to the liberal side or I'm converting people to the conservative side. And you're not making any difference. And you're, and you're wasting your platform that God has given you. And maybe you need to be honest about those things. And you need to begin to sacrifice and grieve those things. I'm calling you to repent tonight. I'm calling you to think differently. I'm calling you to repent and do the hard things now so that you can be the person who your heavenly father longs for you to be. That it's only through repentance that the accusations can be silenced, that the lies can cease, that the chains can fall off and the bondage be broken. That if you've come in here tonight and you have a pattern of sin confess, sin confess, and you're like so frustrated, why do I keep doing this? I need help. I hate this. It's time to repent. That we're not preparing anymore. That it's game day, baby. It's time to hit the field and it's time to get some action and get after it so that we can experience real change, lasting change, God-honoring change tonight. And maybe you're here and you're thinking, man, how do I do this? Well, real quickly, point number three, if you're taking notes, you can write this question down. How do I do this or how to repent? How to repent. And in Luke chapter 15, there's kind of this model of, of a guy who, man, he, he hit rock bottom. He was broken over a sin. And then he, he begins to help us understand how do you functionally repent. And what we see in this story that's called the parable of the prodigal son that Jesus told, we see that repentance involves this man's mind, his emotions, and his will. And so if you're new to the Bible, Jesus is telling a series of stories in Luke 15, and he says this, he says there was a, a, a dad who had two sons, an older and a younger, and the younger came to him, and he said, Dad, I want my inheritance, which back in the day was basically saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. I'm ready for the money. Dad, you know, kind of crazy in the story to create some drama, Jesus says, Dad, you know, he gives him his money. So son gets his inheritance, a third of all of the estate wealth, and he, he runs to like Vegas, and he gets prostitutes, he's gambling. This, not Vegas isn't in the Bible, but it's Vegas in the day. Anyway, he finds himself in this place where he's like having, living it up, man. He's partying, and then the money runs out, and then all of his friends run out. Some of y'all got some friends like that. And he finds himself working for this farmer who has pigs, and pigs back in the day that was considered like the most unclean animal and he's feeding these pigs and he's so hungry because there's a famine where he was living that he's like man I wish I could eat what those pigs are eating and the story goes on Jesus is saying that he, he's kind of trying to paint this picture that this guy had dropped to an all-time low in his life and then it says in Luke 15 verse 17 that he came to his senses that he had a, it involved his mind, he began to repent because repentance, again, is, is a change of your thinking, that he came to his senses and he was kind of looking around going, what am I doing here? Like, like why, why am I doing this? Why am I here? I was talking to a lady a few days ago and she was telling me about how she was strung out, selling herself for drugs. And she said, the breaking point was when I was running them streets, is what she said. And she looked around, and she was passing by her house. She looked and saw her youngest son in the window looking for his mama. And she thought, what am I doing? She said, that began a series of reactions. I came to my senses. She was beginning to repent. And that's what happens in the story. It goes on that you see the involvement of this man's emotions, that he, he gets this plan together and he says, I'm going to go to my dad. And in verse 19, he says, I'm going to say, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Like this guy, he's broken, that he's grieved over the fact that he had sinned against his dad. And he's like, I, I don't want to do this anymore. And, and he, I, I'm sorry for what I've done. I realize I've wasted it all. It's involving his mind. It's involving his emotions and then finally his will. And in verse 18, it says that he, he said, I will arise. He gets a plan together. I will arise and I will go to my father and I will say to him that repentance isn't just feeling sorry. It's not just shedding some tears. It's getting a plan together. And it says, I'm going to do these things even though it's going to require sacrifice even though it's going to be hard. Repentance is hard work, but it's worthy work. 
that holy work is hard work. And what we see is that this man, he says, I'm going to get this plan and I'm going to go make things right. But some of you, in order for you to repent properly, you got you to create some restitution. A buddy of mine, he we used to run, run them streets in middle school. And uh, yeah, whatever that means. But we did, we did stuff that we shouldn't have done. And, um, and so he goes to a different high school down in Huntsville and I stay in East Texas and he winds up in the military, special, special forces, and he comes to Christ in his 20s. He calls me up a few years ago. He's like, bro, I need to apologize to you. I'm like, for what? He's like, for what we did in middle school. And then he's like, man, I gave my life to Jesus and I'm trying to call everybody I know that I misrepresented Christ in front of. And you're one of the guys. That some of you, in order to activate your repentance, you need to make restitution with some people. And what we see here in Luke 15, that the mind is changing and the emotions are feeling godly sorrow. The will is forming a plan of action for restitution and victory and repentance is taking place. And I love this story because you see him kind of get things together. He's headed back to his father's house. And what we would expect is that the narrative in his mind is like, all right, I'm going to say this, I'm going to say this. And my dad, he's probably going to come at me hard. And so I'm going to dodge his left, I'm going to dodge his right, and then I'm going to hug him, you know, and I'm going to make sure it's all good, you know. And he's thinking, I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to get shamed, I'm probably going to get condemned. He may kill me, but we're going to go with it, all right? That's the narrative. And so when his father sees him from a distance, What Jesus says is that this father, he represents our heavenly father, and he takes off running after this prodigal child. And as the prodigal child says, I'm not worthy, he says, shh. He lavishes his grace and his love upon him. And he says, bring me the ring and the, and bring me the cloak and bring me the sandals. And what he was saying is, I am reinstituting this son of mine that was dead and is now alive. And let's celebrate the word in the Old Testament for repent is this Hebrew word, shuv. And it's always tied to this. The guys, they would say, hey, you shuv, and God will shuv too. The way it's translated in your Bible is turn. And what, what they were saying is that when you turn from your sin, God's going to turn to you. That when you shuv, God shuvs too. And what we see is that Jesus is borrowing this ideology as he's telling the story that this prodigal child, he shooved from the pig pen. And when he shooved and began to head back to his father, his father shooved and ran after him. I was talking with one of our young adults, a young woman named Tori. She was a rebel. She went through some hard things in her upbringing in church and got burned. And then when she went to college, she was like, I'm running away from everything I ever knew in this book or ever heard from a place like this. And she said, I went all into the world, got involved in all kinds of things, and it was really hard. Had the chance to go to Germany after graduating from KU. And I got to Germany, and, and as I boarded a plane and got ready, I grabbed this backpack that my mom had put some things in, and she had put one of these books. It's called the Bible. So I'd, I'd grown accustomed to reading, and I didn't have any material with me, so I grabbed the Bible, and I started reading, started in the book of Psalms, and I kind of mocked the person that wrote Psalms at how desperate they sounded. But I kept reading, and, and, it, and it kind of was like, you know what, maybe I need to learn more about Jesus. And so I went to the parts where it talks about Jesus, and, and I was fascinated because it was like he was kind to people like prostitutes and outsiders, and he was really mean to the religious church folk. And, and I was just fascinated with Jesus. And she said, I was in a, my apartment in Germany. And I read about Jesus in a place called John chapter 4. Where he went out of his way to find this woman that was an outcast. That had rebelled in her life and ran away from God. And he talked to her. And he changed her life and he gave her living water. She said, I found myself in tears on the floor of my Germany apartment. Saying, God... It's like you went out of your way to find her. You've gone out of your way to find me. And she said, I asked Jesus to save me. And she began repenting. She called up her friend and the friend said, I've been praying that God would move in your life. And if you've come in here tonight and you've been running away from God, it's time to repent. 
and no one here can outrun the redeeming work of Jesus Christ. Uh, there's one more thing that repentance does. We find in Luke chapter 15 that repentance is the thing that heaven gets fired up about. That Jesus said in Luke 15 that there's more joy in heaven over one person repenting than 99 people that got it all together. What do you need to repent of? And what do you say tonight? You get personal. And you do the thing that excites the party hall in heaven. And you repent. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for tonight. I pray that you would help us to be aware of the thing that you're trying to work out in our life. God, I pray if we come here and we've We've done things recently that we, we regret, God, that we would be open about those things and we would begin the process of healing. God, would you grant repentance to every individual here tonight? The, the president and the, and the presidential candidates are debating tonight. We don't need political reform. We need repentance. We need your spirit to move to heal the things that are broken in our nation to heal divided neighborhoods. God, we need repentance so that we can get free from exploiting people in the sex industry. God, we need repentance so that we can get free from the anxiety that is killing our peers. God, we need repentance. Help us to take the first step. God, help us to shove. Help us to turn. Change our mind. Help us to eliminate the rationalizations and the stories that we brought up in our mind that help us to justify why we can be disobedient. God, help us to find a father that's running after us. May you embrace us and welcome us into a following after you with love and with grace. In Christ's name I pray, amen.